Welcome to IVF This, episode 75, Reactivity versus Resiliency. Welcome to IVF This. I'm your host, Emily Ginn. I'm a mother to two beautiful and feral boys. I'm married to my favorite person in the world. I'm a social worker, a life coach, and an IVF warrior. I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and emotions during your IVF journey, to break free from anxiety and regain control of your life, even in the midst of infertility. I'm going to teach you to say IVF this to how we think about, talk about, and experience infertility. Let's go. Hello, 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 my beautiful friends. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. I will tell you that getting back into the groove of writing and recording these podcasts has been a little bit more difficult than I expected. It's not a lack of want to, because I love writing and I love recording and getting these episodes out to all you. Um, One, it's a question of logistics. We've had a lot going on in our family recently and carving out time for researching, writing and recording has been a bit of a challenge. And two, I have been spinning out in a laundry list of shoulds. That's right, friends. Your coach is just like you. I should on myself occasionally, especially when I feel like I have this belief that I've lost momentum, uh, which is just a thought. And I know this, but that is typically one of the signals that I need to do a little bit more intense thought work or intentional thought work. And that's when I find myself saying things like I'm behind or something in that vein. Now, what I have found time and time again, and what I tell you all, is the shoulds will always leave us feeling worse. They are not motivational at all. Sure, you might do what you're telling yourself to do, that you should be doing, that you need to do, that you have to do, but it probably won't feel great, and it probably won't be consistent, because it's kind of impossible to take positive action from a negative emotion. So because I caught myself in the land of the shoulds, I did a ton of paper thinking, which if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know that's what I call journaling. And I wrote down a bunch of thoughts around how a new mom should prioritize her day, her baby, her family. I wrote down a bunch of thoughts about how an entrepreneur should have prepped for an absence, quote unquote, better, knowing full well that that better is a completely subjective idea and that I took all the conceivable steps to prepare my business for a prolonged absence. I wrote down a bunch of my thoughts around my clients and potential clients. The thoughts were all there, friends. And all the same craptastic a-hole brain stuff that feeds you, mine gets fed the same way too. But here is where we get to talk about what I wanted to talk about today. Through my experience in thought work, I have developed emotional resiliency. I think that many of us hear the word resiliency, uh, maybe in counseling. It's also talked a lot about just kind of in our cultural lexicon of words. But the Google definition of resiliency is the ability to adapt to stressful situations or crises. And I think that this definition is often misunderstood and misused. So I want to use the working definition used by one of my favorite coaches, Carl Lowenthal, which is the ability to maintain calm and a happy emotional state. Now, to ensure that there is not a misunderstanding when I describe this, let me be abundantly clear when I say the ability to maintain a calm and happy emotional state does not mean all of the time. There is no perfect game in thought work or emotions. It's never the goal, ever. The opposite of emotional resiliency is emotional reactivity. So if resiliency is the ability to kind of spring back to a normal baseline state, after an intense situation or a trigger, then reactivity is that reaction to the situation stimulus trigger or where your brain tells you there's an emergency and there's not an emergency. I used to get this a lot when I was running late. Full disclosure, I'm not the most punctual person. Like I'm generally not super late. Um, Like the, the people who say that, you know, five minutes early is on time, right? Usually that five minute plus or minus, I probably won't be there more than five minutes before, and I'm typically there no later than five minutes after. But it used to be, and sometimes it still happens, that regardless of when I am set to arrive, I would be telling myself that I'm running late. Like all of the alarm bells in my brain going off all at the same time. Three alarms happening at once. 
Remember, our brain cannot, cannot tell the difference between a physical threat and a psychological or an emotional threat. It interprets it all the same. So in my brain, whenever I'm telling myself that I'm running late, my brain interprets that as I've done something wrong or something has gone wrong because I'm running late. And remember, this is regardless of actually being late because it's not the time, it's my thinking, my brain, and especially my body can't tell that it's only thoughts. I still get the same physiological response by thinking I'm running late as you would if you were walking home and you felt like someone was following you, that rush of adrenaline and cortisol. So if that is reactivity, then resiliency would be able to return to that, oh, okay, I'm safe, nothing to see here, folks, kind of a state. It is important to know that there is not a threshold for time-specific resiliency, right? There's no barometer or time that says that you are resilient if you can bounce back within three minutes, five minutes, a month, whatever, right? That is completely arbitrary idea. Emotional resilience is this ability to weather whatever is going on around you without deviating too much from your normal, calm, steady state, however you might want to describe it. And reactivity is like this constant feeling of being flung in a million directions away from that baseline state by anything, everything that happens outside of you. Before I discovered coaching, my emotional resilience was not very high. I was pretty reactive. And if you look around you, I bet you're going to recognize after you listen to this that most people have very little emotional resiliency and are pretty reactive because so many of us walk around talking about being stressed and burned out all the time. In fact, that's probably one of the biggest indicators of emotional reactivity is this constant feeling of being stressed out, burned out, exhausted most or every day. Does an email or a phone call throw you into a panic? Do you obsess over every detail of the IVF experience? Constantly scouring the internet for information to help you quote unquote feel better or constantly checking the Facebook infertility IVF groups for any nugget of information or semblance of hope? Do you find that you can't control your mind and that you continue to fixate or ruminate on things and you just like to stop, but you can't, you can't stop your brain? Do you constantly feel like you're an emotional roller coaster and the best you can do is just hold on for dear life? Yeah. When you wake up in the morning, you have no idea how you're going to feel by the end of the day. Do you find that you're often telling people that you're maybe too sensitive or that you take things too personally, you just feel too deeply, or you're too empathetic? These are things that we think are good qualities, but they're actually a sign that we don't have appropriate boundaries and we don't have any emotional resiliency or very little emotional resiliency. So all of these things are signs of emotional reactivity. Any one of them actually is a sign of emotional reactivity. You don't have to have all of them, although a lot of people do. Emotional reactivity is caused by an out-of-control brain. Your brain's like a freaking labradoodle puppy that hasn't gotten enough exercise and just got out of its crate after a long day. It's not trying to make a mess, but there's going to be at least a ruined house, maybe, if you don't take charge of what's going on up there. Everyone's emotional reactivity is displayed in different ways. For instance, my emotional reactivity is typically anger, which I would presume is a lot of people's as well. My best friend, her emotional reactivity looks a lot more like sadness and anxiety. It looks different for different people. So regardless of how you display it, emotional reactivity is what happens when you don't manage your mind and you act on your unconscious thoughts and you lash out at others, or you lash out at yourself, kind of inwards. You catastrophize, you take things personally, you always see the worst, you kind of freak out, all of which creates an enormous amount of emotional stress and suffering for yourself. Especially if you're someone who finds that you often freak out, and then it turns out to be like, nothing was ever really wrong. Now, that doesn't preclude the possibility of something being wrong, like you're waiting to get news from the clinic or waiting for a test result or something like that. But by and large, 
Emotional reactivity is this emotional labor that you're in, in constantly anticipating something happening or something terrible happening usually. When you are emotionally reactive, you don't have control over where you spend your emotional or even your physical energy because your emotions happen inside your body. So it's using up a lot of physical energy to have those reactions. You're basically on a hormonal roller coaster with your stress responses firing all of the time. The other problem with emotional reactivity is that you don't really have the ability to refuel yourself. So when you don't have resilience, when you're just reactive, you end up always scraping the bottom of the emotional barrel. It's kind of like driving a car where the fuel gauge is always on empty. So many of you, I'm sure, have been around someone like this, or maybe you're the person. And you have this tiny thing producing huge emotional responses and dramatic meltdowns, like a train being late or a small mistake that really isn't a big deal. You're unable to cope with the normal events of life. And then if something extra challenging happens, you're totally screwed because you have no resiliency left. You have nothing in the tank because the tank is always empty. That's emotional reactivity. Emotional resiliency is the ability to maintain an even emotional keel and to process emotions appropriately without being derailed by your thoughts and feelings. I kind of like to use the analogy of like the biological function of homeostasis. So in biology, which I'm not an expert at, so don't come at me if you are, homeostasis is the ability of an organism to maintain a consistent internal environment even in a variety of external conditions. One of my coaches, Carl Lowenthal, again, came up with this analogy. Think of the human body, right? You know, we have an average body temperature of about 98 degrees Fahrenheit, and it really doesn't deviate much from that. You get to 101, and that's called a fever. You're sick. Three degrees up, and you have an illness. Seven degrees up, and well, you're, you're probably dead. So it's a really narrow range around 98 degrees. Even when you're really hot, right? Absent being sick, if you're really hot, you're still going to be around 98 degrees. You can be in a desert where it's 120 degrees, but your body temperature is still around 98. You can be in the Arctic where it's zero degrees and your body temperature, presuming you're dressed appropriately, is going to be around 98. So your body is incredibly adept at maintaining its temperature, its internal condition, regardless of the external stimulus. It calibrates and compensates accordingly. So the emotional version of that doesn't mean that you only like ever have a three degree span of emotions. The way your body is basically within three degrees of 98. That is not what I'm saying. It's more like a rubber band that has this amount of stretch or anything that kind of keeps its shape. Apply force and it may stretch out a bit, but it will snap back or gently, not necessarily snap, but gently go back to its original shape. And that's emotional resilience. But the point is that your emotional life is stable, even when there's a disruption to return to your baseline fairly quickly, and you can kind of stay there no matter what the hell's going on outside of you. So if something pulls you or pushes you, it doesn't bend you out of shape, like there's a little bit of give and then you come right back. And emotional resiliency is important because without it, you're just totally at the mercy of your brain and your emotions can swing wildly depending on the circumstances happening around you. It makes your life calmer, gives you more energy. It helps you in your career, in school, physically healthier, uh, relationships. Oh, you don't require so much. You don't need as much like over shopping, over eating, over drinking. You don't need those kind of buffers because you're not needing to avoid the extremes of the emotional reactivity, right? Because you'll know how to cope with your emotions. So you're probably like, "Um, okay, we get it, but how? How do we develop it? Such a great question. It's actually kind of two parts. The first is allowing and actually processing your emotions. I have a whole podcast called Feel Better Now that outlines this process that I teach. 
But most of us stop at naming the emotion. A lot of us are good at noticing. Maybe you're feeling anxious. Maybe you've done counseling or anything in the past that you can identify a feeling in any given moment. And that's great. If you don't feel like that's a strength of yours, I have amazing news for you. It's totally learnable. But basically, and again, if you want a more thorough explanation, check out the Feel Better Now episode. But you want to notice or name the emotion. That's the in in the now process, N-O-W. O, the O is opening up to it. So you're not resisting it. You are literally and emotionally opening yourself up to the experience, to that emotion. And the last one, the W, is to witness the emotion. Witnessing it is a lot like explaining what is happening inside of your body. For instance, when I feel anxious, it feels like I have a black 15-pound bowling ball in my stomach, but with rough edges, and it feels like it's bouncing up and down. And that's what I mean by witnessing what is happening inside of your body. You want to describe the physical sensations that you are experiencing. This is the most effective way to get the hell out of your brain, which is what is required when you are processing an emotion. When I do this, I tell my clients to close their eyes because when their eyes are open, their brain is looking for things. And I'm sorry, but your brain is not invited to this particular party. This party is for the body. This is a way to teach your brain that emotions are safe. We treat our emotions like they are a crisis, especially anxiety. They're not. Your feelings cannot hurt you. I'm not saying that it doesn't seem like they can hurt you. Really strong emotions like grief and anxiety, it does feel like you could actually be dying. But they can't actually hurt you. So physically grounding yourself and processing your feelings by allow them to pass through you as a physical sensation and describing that and allowing that and not thinking the thought that perpetuates it, that is the first part of developing emotional resilience. Because part of what happens in emotional reactivity is that you start to have a feeling and then you freak out that you're having that feeling, right? So processing the emotion kind of takes off that second part, the freak out part, so that we can deal with the original freak out, right? We don't want two freak outs. One is more than enough, and that's what we can deal with. So you process the emotion to deal with it, the physical aspect of the freak out, and then you manage your mind to create emotional resilience. The reason that you're emotionally reactive is that you don't have any control over your brain. So it's just running around wild, creating horrible scenarios to scare you and telling you that everyone hates you and that you're worthless and that you're going to die nearly every day. It's like your brain is creating a damn Stephen King novel at every turn. So when you don't exercise control over your brain, you don't have any resiliency and you're subject to its every whim and random destructive question, thought, whatever. When you learn to manage your mind, you stop being so reactive. Now, at first, it is a little bit of a painstaking process. You have to pay attention to a lot of the thoughts that are coming in and noticing them and shifting them. When you're emotionally reactive, you are believing all your thoughts without question. You are acting like your emotions are an emergency. You are believing that your emotions are somehow true and valid and have to be happening and are telling you something important and that you're believing the thought, whatever it is, and then believing that to be totally true. Your emotions are valid, but you have to remember that your emotions are created by your thinking. So if you're thinking something that creates this horrible feeling, it's not that your feeling isn't valid, it's that the flaw is in your thinking. That's emotional reactivity. You are not exercising any judgment or discretion over what you believe, and you're not taking responsibility for your own thoughts and feelings. You are just reacting to whatever comes at you as if you're in a batting cage without a bat and just being pelted with balls. When you're managing your mind, it's like you get to decide which balls to swing at and which to let go by. Baseball players don't take every pitch that is thrown at them, right? Some are good tosses and some are junk. Your brain is the same way. Sometimes it's good. Offer up a gem and that's when you hit the home run. It's written all over that pitch, right? And sometimes it's going to toss out some trash. You don't have to swing at everything. Emotional reactivity is swinging at every pitch, 
regardless. Even just starting with noticing the thoughts coming in and asking yourself, is that true? How might that not be true? What else could that mean? Right? Again, just not taking your thoughts at 100% truth. When you are emotionally reactive, you can't control your reactions. You feel they are happening instantaneously, but they don't. They are caused by your thoughts. Very fast subconscious thoughts. And some of them you're not even aware of yet. But the better you get at noticing and changing your thoughts, the less reactive you'll be. And these two things go hand in hand. You have to practice emotional processing, the physical sensation describing it, because that is what kind of takes the body's reaction down so that you can actually get access to the thinking. You have to do the emotional work before you can get to the cognitive work. Emotions have to come first every time. You have to be willing to have that feeling and kind of communicate to your brain that it's not a big deal and that you've got a hold of the ship and that everything's okay. And then you can get better at what's causing the feeling, the thinking, what is happening in your brain. So the better you get at noticing and changing your thoughts, the less reactive you'll be overall. And eventually you'll develop true emotional resiliency and the daily irritations and frustrations and and stressors will stop creating that adrenaline and cortisol and the stress and anxiety response that happens in your brain and your body. So that's emotional reactivity and emotional resilience. Most people go around in emotional reactivity all of the time. And the true journey towards taking responsibility of your own life is developing emotional resilience. And then once you have emotional resilience, you can create the life that you've always wanted. And yes, this can be done even while going through IVF and infertility. It's completely possible. I coach women every day on how to do this. It is a tremendous gift to give yourself this type of peace and calm and stability that comes with emotional resilience. It is a beautiful thing. You're less bothered. You're less anxious. You're more present. It's incredible. And that's what I want for each and every one of you. So if this is something that you're wanting, go to my website, www.ivfthiscoaching.com and book a free mini session. And I can start to teach you how to do this. Okay, that is what I have for you today, my friends. Have a beautiful week and I will talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of IVF This. If you like what you've heard, click subscribe and follow to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you want to learn more, head over to www.ivfthiscoaching.com to learn how to work together.